folks are joining us here this evening for the, the Radio Club of America interview series. Uh, today is October 6th. And uh, Angel, you're in the, uh, the the big chair there at Arecibo. So that's your office though, right? No, no. My office is adjacent. This is the, uh, this is where the real work happens. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh so would that be classified as the control room, Angel? This, this is the control room. This is, I'm sitting in the, uh, the telescope operations technician's chair. There's a person sitting in this chair uh, uh, for tw 24 hours, 24-7, uh, 365. There's always someone in this chair. Excellent. And um, <laughs> it's nice of uh, the rest of them to let you be in the chair this evening. Yeah, that's right. So I, I thank my guys for letting me in here. Uh, <laughs> and so, but after yeah. after forty three years, I think uh, that says something, right? Oh uh, yeah. So so um, are are we uh, are are we live with the RCA? No, not yet. We have okay. uh, one minute to go. Okay. So at the top of the sure. hour. Okay. At the You'll top of the hour, we'll that's kick one. it off, Angel, and okay. we'll we'll get started here. Yeah, but after, that's right. So after forty three years, it's a, it's a, it's a. It's, it's an experience to work with these guys. These guys have been great. These guys are great. And, and, and I've, got, I've got my best guy here today, too. <laughs> and uh, K1JT is already, or Joe Taylor has already raised his hand. Uh, Joe. <laughs> tell him, like, Joe, I can't uh, tell him. No FDA questions, Joe. <laughs> All uh, right. It, it's 9 o'clock here <clears throat> in the Eastern Time Zone. It's time for the <clears throat> Radio Club of America interview series. And we're very happy to have over 100 uh, participants uh, here logged in. And uh, I think we're going to have a great evening. Um, and we want to thank uh, uh, last, the last interview series was with Ted Rappaport. And that went very well. And we're looking forward to an exciting evening uh, here tonight. And we thank all of you for your support of the Radio Club of America. And... Uh, uh, I want to remind everybody, we have uh, two moderators that are uh, going to help us this evening. Uh, I want to introduce Scott Jones. Uh, Scott is the uh, sales manager at DX Engineering. And then I want to introduce attorney Barney Scholl. Barney is uh, vice president uh, counsel for the Radio Club of America. And thank you both for being here. And uh, with that, I want to introduce our speaker and our interviewee is uh, Angel uh, Vasquez and Angel is uh, located at Arecibo, one of the best places on the earth. And welcome, uh, Angel, and thanks very much for being here this evening. Oh, thank you very much, there, Tim. And first, I uh, want to say hi to all my RCA friends. Okay, being part of the RCA, I want to thank you, Tim. Uh, also, as uh, President Emeritus, I'm getting pretty good treatment here. So, uh, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me uh, to this series. Following Ted Rappaport is uh, it's not easy. I know how uh, uh, <laughs> how uh, how that that could be. Uh, so um, I know how Rodney Dangerfield felt when he had to follow uh, Frank Sinatra in the Tonight Show. So anyway, <laughs> well, Angel, uh, let's uh, let's start out with uh, telling uh, our viewers here tonight, uh, and uh, I want to remind all of our viewers, all of our participants, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Uh, please put your questions in the chat, and uh, and you can also use the Q&A, and our moderators will pick up those questions, and periodically we'll stop and uh, we'll do some interactive questions with Angel here this evening. Sure. So welcome to everybody. And Angel, uh, a little bit about your background. Uh, sure. how, did, how did this whole thing start for you? Okay, well, great. And again, I, let me say hi to all my friends out there. Uh, and especially the, the guys, our friends there on BGFN and everywhere else all around the world that are following us. Well, uh, Tim, um, it's funny. You know, I, well, I, I was born here. And I, you know, I'm pretty lucky to be here sitting, sitting in this chair uh, because I was born in Arecibo, actually. Uh, my parents lived in uh, Brooklyn, New York, but when my mom was, uh, uh, was expecting, my dad said, no, this, you've got to be born in Arecibo. So I was born where he was born, and, and uh, so I was here, and, uh, but at the age of, uh, of two, uh, we moved back to New York, and I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, okay? So, uh, yeah, so I, I've lost my accent. I try to go back and, and you know, and, and refresh it, but uh, so all my schooling years were, were in New York. I studied at the CUNY 
in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And um, obviously growing up in Brooklyn was a, was a great experience for me. Uh, but we had, the, we had the opportunity of visiting Puerto Rico uh, very often. Uh, luckily with, that, or my, with my dad uh, and my mom and visiting family here. So I always wanted to come back and, and, and move back into Puerto Rico. So I worked as a radio engineer. My first um, uh, uh, venture in the, uh, in the real world was as a radio engineer for a WNYC uh, FM. I did, it's AM and FM. They also did, they also had a TV station. Uh, so we experimented, uh, you know, cameraman work and, uh, and video tech and stuff. But I, I always, I, I liked the, the, the radio part. Uh, so um, uh, we, were radio, we were radio engineer for about a year. And uh, there, and then we had to move to, to Puerto Rico. My ex-wife uh, was Hispanic, so uh, we uh, we said, okay, so let's pack up and uh, and and move out. So we moved to uh, to Puerto Rico, and um, and then I got hired. Uh, a few months, I was not here for a few months when I got hired by the by the Arecibo Observatory, and uh, that was in August twenty fifth, nineteen seventy seven. So Tim, I have been here for forty three years. And I have met some incredible people, and a lot of the people that are here on on, on uh, in in this uh, in this uh, Zoom chat. Uh, one of the first people I met uh, there, Tim, was uh, uh, Dr. James K. Breakall, or uh, my friend, which is uh, my my brother from another mother. And so Jim was actually first one of the first persons I met, apart from the guy that was giving me training, who, which was also a ham, KP4 Romeo Echo Yankee, and then uh, then uh, one of the first uh, scientists. Uh, that I that I met luckily for me was a uh, uh, I guess many of you may know him <laughs> a K1 JT Joe Taylor uh, so uh, uh, Joe was one of the first uh, one of the first people also that I met so I've known Joe for for exactly 43 years as I know uh, uh, Jim and many many others and working at the observatory has been such a fantastic part of my life and the funny thing is that I want to tell you um, uh, Tim and everyone else is that. I was in the, uh, in the professional radio field, okay? And I was, I have to admit, I was very ignorant about amateur radio. And uh, I owe all this, this eye-opening of amateur radio to my good friend, uh, Jim Brakel. Uh, Jim, you were saying, you know, Jim has very few friends that are not hams. And so, <laughs> so I, the Jim was like, always, uh, you know, telling me about this. So I got involved and I said, I, I, again, when I said I was ignorant to it, I said, well, why, why, why should I get an amateur license when I, you know, I've got a, you know, I got a first class radio telephone. Why, 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 why do I need this? And obviously that was, that was my, that was my, my eye opening to the ignorance. Becoming a ham has been such a big part now of what I do here because at the radio observatory, at the radio, at the Arecibo radio telescope, what I, as what we all do as hams, I get to do here, and luckily, don't tell anyone, I get paid for it, okay? And so it's the same thing that we do in our house, but on a large, much larger scale, obviously. We have, the, we have transmitters, we have receivers, and, uh, and we have uh, all different receivers. We have, to, we have to deal with the ionosphere. We have to deal with RFI. So it's just, it's, and, and what opened my eyes to that was amateur radio. So, Angel, let's let's talk about how uh, Arecibo, the observatory, got started. So, some of the history of the observatory before. I know you're in the control room now, but let's let's talk about some of the history and how you know the the people and the organizations and the institutions that have been critical to making the observatory what it is today. Sure. Well. Okay, so the observatory, the construction started in 1959, okay, and, and terminated, uh, the, finished the construction in 63. So um, originally, uh, there was an Air Force uh, type thing to study the, uh, the, uh, the ionosphere. I uh, met Dr. Uh, William Gordon of uh, Carleon University, who was the first entity to run, they, to, to, well, it was, it was a little bit later that they ran the, uh, the, the observatory, but uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the years, were first because of, uh, of, of Cornell University and Dr. William Gordon, who was, his, which this was his brainchild. And so the, um, again, so that was back in 1963. The original, if, if you've all seen pictures of the, of the dish, the original uh, dish 
uh, was not what you see now. And unfortunately, it's a little bit different now after, uh, after the damage, which we'll get into there later. But uh, the original uh, mesh was this uh, half-inch chicken mesh and, um, and that, that, that covered the 20 acres of our dish, which is 1,000 feet across. And so this, uh, having that type of a mesh didn't permit us to go higher in frequencies. It just permitted us to go pretty low in frequencies because of the surface of the dish. To get higher, you need a higher accuracy dish. So that was rectified in 1974. So in 1974, they, they removed the, the 20 acres of that, uh, of that chicken mesh and, uh, probably, and gave it out to a lot of the people here in the, in, in the, around the observatory. What are you gonna do with the uh, 20 acres of a mesh? But anyway, uh, then they installed about 39,000 of these three by six foot panels, which are here now. Okay, so that, that uh, and uh, tweaking that surface uh, back, at, which, which did take a long time, well, the, uh, <clears throat> to get higher in frequencies, well, uh, made a big, a big made, a, made, a, made a huge difference, okay? Uh, first of all, uh, the RMS error uh, originally across the 1,000 feet, across the 1,000 feet was less than two millimeters, okay? That was the RMS error. That's, a, that's a, an, a, an incredible thing when you've got it, when you think about, there's, these are 39,000 panels, three by six, Okay, and each one is a corner. And let's, let's, let's remind everyone that this dish is not fixed to the ground. This is suspended by a whole network of cables. And that, that means that this rib has to, you have to put these panels on this rib. And so we'll, we'll take, you know, back, back in the day, we, you know, we, we put all the panels up and we had a reflector in each corner with a theolo light that we measured. And it took about three years to, to measure that. And then what happens? So we get all the numbers back and then now, now we've got to start tweaking it. So that means that, uh, okay, panel A1, okay, top left, the top left corner of A1, okay, you got to turn that screw a quarter of an inch that way, this one quarter of an inch, you get the idea. For yeah. 30, and we had to do this for 30, it took about five, almost five, five years to, to tweak up the, the whole system. But when we did, it was absolutely fantastic. With that upgrade also came uh, the upgrade to the S-band planetary radar system. We did have, uh, there's always been three radial sciences in, at, uh, at the observatory. Okay, the three radial sciences studied here are, um, is uh, the original one, uh, which the observer, it used to be called the Odyssey Ionospheric Observatory, was studying the ionosphere, starting at the, at the atmosphere. And we do, we have a, a transmitter, a 2.5, and later we'll, 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 we'll get to see all this equipment. Uh, we have a 2.5 megawatt a transmitter at 430 megahertz. Yes, the same 430 megahertz that hands use. And uh, it is a shared band. And so we have a, uh, uh, again, this, uh, this is pulsed, okay? This, this, uh, this, this uh, transmitter is the one that is used for atmospheric studies, okay? Study ion densities and the like. And, uh, but it's not CW. We, we use it at a, at a 6% duty cycle. So, you know, but still, you know, the, 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 the pulse, the, 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 the maximum output uh, uh, there is, is about 2.5 megawatts. That's, that's okay. So that's one, that's one radial science. The other radial science is <clears throat> a planetary radar. Planetary radar, now we use a 2380 megahertz S-band transmitter. And uh, that, uh, that transmitter, that we use that to study, uh, to bounce signals off the nearby comets, planets, and asteroids. Obviously, asteroids being a very big, uh, big, big deal with us because... Um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the most sensitive place on Earth to study these things is Arecibo because of the, the large uh, 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 receiving area. Um, then the third uh, radio sciences is, just, is radio astronomy, which is just a passive receiving. And uh, uh, we know, like, like Joe, the, the studies pulsars, quasars, the new fast radio burst, and, and the like. So those are the three radio sciences. And um, so... With this upgrade, a lot of these sciences came into, uh, into effect. And then right after that, right after that, is when Joe Taylor, speaking of Joe again, uh, Joe uh, discovered 
uh, here in, in Arecibo, uh, 1913 plus 16, the binary pulsar, which uh, earned Joe and Russ Holtz the Nobel Prize back in 93. So um, uh, a, lot of us, a lot of this has gone on, and that up, so that was the upgrade uh, from there. There's been many, many uh, uh, also discoveries. Uh, we discovered the, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Mercury's uh, uh, orbit around the Earth was not that what it was. It's actually different. And we also discovered there was a solar cap. Uh, there was a, an ice cap on Mercury. Who would think that, that Mercury, so next to the, uh, the sun, had an ice cap? And um, so there, there, there's been a lot. We, we, we did the, we did the, um, uh, the radar maps for Venus when uh, back in, in the 80s when we were doing uh, uh, the, the, uh, these space emissions uh, to Venus. Remember, you can't, you can't see the, the, the surface of Venus unless you have a radio a radar uh, because it is shrouded with, with clouds. And so, and so things like that, and we still, to this day, well, and to the trajectory of this. And then, oh, by the way, so that was in 74, but 95 is now the picture that most everyone sees now is when we, we uh, installed the Gregorian dome system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And why the Gregorian dome system? We have if, if seen the, from the pictures from before and still uh, the li there's a long line feed, that 430 megahertz line feed, uh, we say used to be long because Maria took care of that. It used to be 96 feet long. Now we have a 25 uh, foot stub up there. Uh, but it used to be 96 feet, but that was a line feed. Where the dome is right now, there also used to be some line feeds in, uh, in what we used to call carriage house too. Out of each corner, there's a box. A box has four corners and then, and then also uh, one antenna in the top center and lower center. So we had six antennas there and these were line feeds. So a line feed is, is, is different than other antennas where the signals, when you, they bounce and they go in a line and and, and, and hit uh, the, uh, these line feeds. What happens, uh, the structure is held up by cables, steel cables. And we know what happens to metal when, when in the, uh, with, with heat and with coal. When in the heat, uh, these cables, they, right, they stretch. And when it gets colder, they, 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 they come back. So what happens is we get this up and down movement and it creates a, a, a real bad, we'll know this, SWR, a high, a, a visual effect on, on the signal. So we'll see a lot of ripples in the signal. So they, so they came up with this Gregorian system. So now this system has this dome. They removed all these line feeds and now they put a Gregorian dome. This, inside this dome, we'll see there is a secondary the primary being the 1,000 foot dish, there's a secondary dome and a tertiary dome. So signals bounce, primary, secondary, tertiary, and then get focused into one point. So whether it moves up and down, we will get in focus. Okay, so that this, will, this, will, uh, this will actually uh, fix this myopia type, if you will, effect of, the, uh, of, of, of these uh, line feeds. And so there's still some, that, that's, that's very basic. There's still other things that always have to be done because, uh, uh, you know, when we added the dome, we also had it 600 tons of weight. So actually the, 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 uh, the platform right now uh, weighs 900 tons there, Tim. So uh, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, calibration, a lot of tweaking has to be done to try to point a 900 ton telescope into one star very, very far away. So Angel, uh, tell us about the control room that you're sitting in. What, okay. what, what is going on there? Okay, so I'm sitting here again. I'm sitting here in the control room. And um, if we can see, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, we've got our, our good friend, Israel Cabrera, KP4 Alpha X-ray. Uh, so I, I guess a little bit higher, we get a little bit higher. A uh, little bit right there. Okay, so in this panel, this is where the, uh, the, the operator sits to control the whole telescope. What's going on in this huge uh, screen here is we monitor the receiver's temperatures, okay? Receivers being because they are cooled, they're helium uh, uh, 
uh, uh, cooled uh, receivers, right? The cryogenically cooled receivers and uh, from about the four to 10 degrees a Kelvin. So we monitor all the refrigerator temperatures of the receivers. We, we monitor the platform height, okay? Because uh, right at when we added the dome, out of each corner of the triangle, we also have uh, this uh, leveling system, okay? And uh, these tie, what we call tie downs. And uh, we also, so we, 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 that being very simple because as you see the, uh, the arm, this dome weighs a huge amount of, it's a huge amount of weight on this dome. And this dome can travel from, from, uh, from the zenith uh, and, and there's a curvature right on, on the arm uh, to about 20 degrees. When it goes out there, it, it, this platform is tilting, okay? So these, these tie downs actually uh, uh, keep this, this thing stable. So like what I said, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, things going on to point this. There's a lot of things. We got a laser ranging system telling us exactly what's going on. So all this is, is, is being said, uh, looked at here. We're looking at the, the voltage uh, all the phase, the voltage phases that come from the observatory. Uh, we're looking at the uh, the, ro the uh, rotating floor because in the dome, again, what I mentioned uh, in the dome is that uh, when this signal bounces off the the the, sec the secondary tertiary and it comes into one point, that one point there is a rotating floor. That rotating floor has many different uh, receivers. And so we monitor that here as well. We monitor uh, the, uh, obviously the, the weather. We monitor RFI over here. This, uh, we monitor the RFI, local RFI, monitor the weather, seismic activity. Uh, so there's uh, another, uh, an another uh, uh, the alpha uh, receivers, which is the one that used to be used uh, uh, back in when we uh, were running a SETI at home project, which many of you probably uh, have heard. And, um, and the pointing, obviously the most important thing, the pointing of the telescope, where, where actually where, where uh, uh, the, the telescope is and, and, that, and that screen up there. So that'll, that'll tell us uh, where the azimuth arm is and, and, um, and, all, and, and, and the different uh, positions of the telescope. And so, uh, yeah. So Angel, uh, scientists from all over the world uh, can remote in and have yeah. access to this. And right. so they, they can have control and uh, right. do experiments, even though they might be on the other side of the world. Exactly. And uh, this is one thing that, uh, uh, that is, that, uh, <laughs> let, let me get this. Uh, okay. And so that, that's one thing that could be done now. Uh, back in, in the day when I started, a scientist had to come here and had to be here personally. Okay, which is lucky for me because I got I got a chance to meet and and talk and pick uh, Joe Joe Joe's Joe's brains and every and everyone else's that that came here. But now, uh, yeah, yeah, all right. yeah, you got to be careful there. Okay, uh, yeah, here. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So I kind of improvise again since we don't have uh, wireless here. Everything has to be wired. So, uh, <laughs> um, so. Um, uh, the uh, scientists now, what happens is when we start an experiment, we will call the, the scientist and the operator will give them the password to enter. Okay, the, the, we, they'll give us the password to enter and the, the uh, scientist could be, a, and then like you said, Tim, in any part of the world, it could be the United States, it could be anywhere, you could be watching the, the Super Bowl and the operator here will do the experiment for, for him. Actually, right now, the operator does 90% of all the work uh, here. So uh, I mean, let me just show you the area where they would be. Yes. Uh, yes. If, uh, if, uh, so, so I guess yes. you, could hold, you could hold this and then you could hold this. Okay, let's let's go this way. Somebody's got it. Alguien cuéntame la cámara. Okay, so let's go. Let's point uh, down this way. And and this area, and this area here, this is where the scientists would sit. Okay, so we were we were uh, back we were back there. there there's the uh, where the operator sits, and then in this uh, uh, operating area, this is where the scientist uh, would, 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 would be. The scientist sits here well, again, and this is historically they're here, uh, but now the operator has total control of the system. And so um, again, uh, historically, they still we still have an area because there's still, there's still uh, people here, se está yendo. 
There are still people here that, uh, that, that, that still have students and from all over university. They still, they still bring their students and get, the, and get a hands-on work. So there's still, there's still scientists that come and, and visit uh, locally the observatory, Tim. So um, in the adjacent room, Angel, can you take us in there let's, and let's describe go through, what's going on? Sure, let's go. So we're going to go now again. Uh, let, this is the, uh, let, let, let me just uh, have this uh, one second here. Let me just uh, show you again. So this is, uh, this is uh, the, the control room. Okay. Uh, there's, there's where we were. There's the uh, scientist area. So now we're going to go. We're going now to, okay, so now, now we're in, let, let me just give you a quick scan here. This is what we call the receiver room. Okay, this is called the receiver room. So let me uh, uh, go right here. And, and someone uh, one right here, the officer Zapata will help, uh, help us here. Okay, so here, here in the receiver room, you can stay right there. Thank you very much. Here in the receiver room, like this is where we call it, we call it the receiver room. Actually, the receivers are up in the platform, like everyone else. Like you all have, so you want to you want to have the receiver as close to uh, to the antenna as possible to prevent any losses. So, but what comes down here is the IF. Okay, it comes through fi fiber optics. It comes down here. So, un poquito más. And okay, and um, and it comes into this room. Okay, so in back of me here, what we see, yeah, perfect, perfect, right there. What you see here, these are basically filters and amplifiers okay filters and amplifiers and then what because we know the scientist knows where's where the signals is, is going to be okay so for example uh if this was our spectrum what we do is uh because we have studies sometimes they do optical studies to get the uh uh, uh the, the the exact um uh, frequency and so we'll study well we know it's going to be arriving here so what we do is we st we study this filter everything out and amplify that did then we do a digital analog conversion and that's what's done in here so basically that's what this equipment does so the if comes down here and so we uh we then filter I, then we do like i said we, we uh, analog the digital conversion and then we can do what we uh, what we can see from up here, like if, if, if the officer Zapata could uh, up here, you know, so he could see it. And so what we have, then we could do these pictures. For example, this is a radar image of, uh, of the moon, okay? Radar image of the moon. Up on the side here, we'll see a radar image of Venus. Again, what I, what I mentioned before, Venus is shrouded by clouds. You could only study it with a, a planetary a radar, with a radar, okay? Over here also, uh, we mentioned uh, asteroids. I'll get, I can hold here, we're gonna have to probably get the, the cable there. Okay, and uh, let's see, we could get a little close up here. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a, uh, an image of an asteroid here. Okay, one of the asteroids, another image of an asteroid here, an interesting one uh, at, at that. Uh, this one, if you see it, uh, we discovered this one at the end of, uh, uh, 2019, I think it was. This was 2019, and this was right after Halloween. And if you look at it, if you look at it close, it looks like a skull. We call it the skull asteroid, and it was around Halloween, funny. And so there, there's one. There's a couple of more asteroids here, and there are the rings of Saturn. Okay, planetary radar also rings of Saturn, and uh, we had some, uh, we had some uh, 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 pictures of, of pulsars out there, just in case. Uh, or other friends, but uh, uh, they were on the other side. And as you can say, okay, so if you could take a look at this, uh, the, this is a picture of an asteroid, okay? And we can see uh, after a couple of days of integrating, we can see that it's rotation. Uh, we can determine, <clears throat> we, we don't do it, that JPL, we send all this information over there to them, but we do the detection and send the information, and then we can see what it's made out of, how big it is, uh, uh, and very important, you know, how, how far, what is its orbit around the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the solar system? Because uh, uh, all asteroids are minor planets, and so they will be coming around again. And so we want to determine, is it okay, is it, is it okay to get a mortgage out on the house? Okay, so make sure, yeah, so, so that we, we, we determine that 
So it's very important thing. So uh, again, and, and we can, again, with this radar signal, we can determine all this, even, what it's, even not what it's made of because of the reflectivity of the signal coming back. Okay. And then at this part here, and we'll see this, is, uh, let's, let's go a little bit further back so we could uh, take a, a nice big, uh, nice uh, look at this. Okay. So uh, let me see there. This is the control panel for that, what I said, the 430 megahertz radar system. As you can see, yes, it has these big knobs, analog, analog meters, and then uh, big buttons, right? And eyes, we have a, a Nixie tube of bulbs on, and <laughs> lights out there. So this is, yes, this is circa 1950s. It's circa 1950. We did not change, they did not change the face of this, uh, but obviously all the electronic, a lot of the electronics in the back has changed. Okay, for example, I don't think that the, that PC was not encrusted there in the 50s and stuff like that. And so that, again, uh, we can see that this uh, uh, does uh, uh, put out here, uh, still there, the, the original plate there, 2.5 uh, megawatts of power. Again, at 6% at duty cycle. So that's the, that's the uh, control panel for that, our uh, atmospheric sciences uh, radar transmitter. And this is the uh, control panel for our planetary radar system, which is just basically, it's just a, a, a monitor and a keyboard, okay? So again, what we were one, uh, saying before about the radio, uh, 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 radio, astro I mean, uh, 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 working as a, a ham at the, at the Odyssey Observatory, this is exactly what do we guys do? The thing is with this transmitter, this transmitter puts out, okay, one megawatt CW, one megawatt CW power. And get this guys, you know how much drive we need to get the one megawatt out? One watt, <laughs> one watt of drive. That's it, that's right. All you need, one watt to get a million out. And then with the, uh, then it has, the system has 70 dB gain. So uh, about 70 dB gain. So again, so the power coming out, the, uh, out of the, the, the transmitter, the effective radiated power will be about 20 times 10 to the 12th or 20 trillion watts. So yes, and uh, that's why, but you see, it's the same thing as we do. Say my L1500 does 1500 watts. This thing can do right there and they, we gotta, you gotta pump it out. But this thing, it, it's, just, it's just it's the same thing, which is why I said it is the coolest place on earth to work, especially if you're a ham. So that's, so, that's the control. Yeah. So, Angel, uh, uh, we're on with Angel Vasquez, who is uh, head of telescope operations down at the Arecibo Observatory in Arecibo, Puerto Rico here as part of the RCA um, interview series. And... Uh, there's uh, a few questions in the Q&A, and if you have a question, please put it into the Q&A, or we can pick it up in the chat as well. Uh, but there's a few questions in there. Sure. So uh, let, let's go, uh, let's grab some questions. Uh, Scott, uh, what do you have for a question for Angel? All right, uh, that's been very interesting, Angel. Thank you so much so far. Sure, thank you very um, much. One of the questions is, what are some of the examples of the research that scientists who are accessing the antenna want to perform or do? And that could be either uh, uh, astronomical research or ion ionospheric research as well. Well, again, uh, since we can do three, uh, three different radio sciences, it depends uh, what the, uh, the scientists, well, we'll, well we, could, we could stay right here, there. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, the proposal and what the scientist and what field the scientist wants to do is work in. Again, you, you, do, you write a proposal, anyone can write a proposal. If it gets accepted, then um, it'll get funded and then you can use the Odyssey Observatory. Uh, different from, from uh, the other observatories is that this is still the, the world's largest radio radar telescope. Yes, everyone says you're no longer the largest single dish telescope. But again, China does not, I know our friends from China, they made a, a, a 500 meter dish as opposed to our 305 meter dish. But again, going back, with, this is multi, multi-faceted, different, different from the, the China. They have, they have no transmitters, okay? They only have one frequency. Their, their, uh, their surface uh, uh, moves 
and, and it has to be adjusted. Ours, ours doesn't. So I, 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 I sometimes I give an analogy in a couple of talks. I said, sure, everyone, everyone here remembers those nice big uh, phones that uh, I guess that you get rotary dials, the phones. And they, but they also have, remember the place with those are nice big phones, nice, big, nice, 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 uh, big phone. But, and then, well, yeah, it does nice things. It's a big phone that does one thing. You can call. It, it's used as a phone. Then again, there's something called like the iPhone, okay, for example. The observatory is the iPhone of the radio, of, of the, uh, radio science world, okay? Multifaceted, do a million things. We can still use it as a phone, but still use it for um, uh, many, many, many different uh, things. So even though, yes, they might have the single uh, largest dish, they are not multifaceted as the Odyssey Observatory, which is why I, 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 I again, Scott, depending on the, uh, um, on the, uh, the experiment you want to do, there's, the, there's, 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 there's all sorts of experiments you can do when you have three radial sciences. So it's a pretty ample question. And we want to thank that, 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 that for that question too. Yes. And so Barney, uh, do you have a, a question from our participants here? Uh, Barney, if you, uh, yeah, actually, uh, we're, we're gathering a lot of questions. But, Angel, if you know of the motivation that created uh, this project, and someone was asking a question, if it was, since it was started in 1959, was it originally conceived during the international geophysical year 1957 period? Uh, are you familiar what sort of what motivated this uh, device to be built back then? Uh, okay. Well, what, what uh, initiated... It was because of the, uh, they want to study the ionosphere, okay? It was an Air Force, Air Force uh, project. Oh. Yeah, uh, it was originally an Air Force, uh, Air Force uh, project, and they originally want to study the ionosphere. Okay, so that's, that's where, that's where it, it, it came from. Uh, again, uh, technology, everything, it changes uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, then they found out that uh, we can use it uh, for, for other uh, uh, sorts. And uh, again, it was taken, it was uh, very well thought out because um, uh, as you notice, uh, uh, Puerto Rico is at an 18 degree latitude, 18 degree latitudes. And so they thought this out because if, we, if just in case in the future you want to be used for radials, uh, for, uh, for radio astronomy, uh, they knew that all the planets uh, pass real close to the equator. So there were a lot of other places in, in, in the world where this uh, uh, could have been put. And luckily for me, it was in Arecibo, but there was places in Hawaii, Cuba, and a couple of places here in, uh, in, uh, in Puerto Rico. And uh, again, it was, it was, it was decided because of, because of this natural sinkhole where this uh, uh, observatory is, it was decided to put here. So there was a lot of things uh, back there, uh, uh, Barney. And uh, I, I wasn't around back then, but uh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> but, uh, well, I actually was on earth, but I wasn't around. <laughs> Th thank you, Angel. Thank you, uh, Scott, yeah, sure. another question for Angel. All right, we have quite a few of them. Um, so one of the questions is, what is your most memorable experimental campaign? The most memorable. Okay, there's a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Again, uh, I, I have to say, and this is, uh, I had the pleasure and the honor of working with Dr. Joe Taylor. And uh, back then, there wasn't any remote observing, okay? I was the remote observer. So I did a lot of the timing for this, uh, this uh, uh, a pulsar that, that won uh, Joe Taylor the, uh, uh, the Nobel Prize. For me, that was, that was very, very satisfying. Very satisfied. I got to do. I got to do all the work, and I got to work with him. So, so I would do. Joe would tell me, "Okay, we'll do this." I'll run the uh, the ephemerides, and then I would observe it. I would time these pulsars for him and for uh, uh, the uh, the first the first planetary system study out. You know that was that was discovered outside of our solar system. Uh, okay, that was also done here at the Odyssey Observatory. So pulsar work for me has been very, uh, very, very satisfying, even though I have to admit that uh, uh, planetary radar was very good to me personally because um, uh, uh, Steve Ostro, who is a silent keynote, Dr. Steve Ostro, which is very, very uh, uh, a famous uh, uh, a planetary scientist, had discovered this asteroid and honored me uh, honored me 
uh, by naming it the 21500 Vasquez. So actually, I have, a, I have an asteroid named after me. Some people get streets and say, I have a planet, a minor planet. So, so that was satisfying for me personally. And, and it's also real, a whole lot of fun operating the transmitters. But I got a lot of, a lot of fun uh, at, uh, at, 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 at doing this, the disposal our works. For me, it was very satisfying. And I always told Joe this, Joe, if I had any brains, I'd do this for a living. But uh, <laughs> uh, Barney, uh, another question for Angel. Well, let's take a, 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 a maybe let's take a simple one, Angel. Where's the maybe it isn't that simple? But where's the funding come from? And I wonder myself: Do the people who want to use these facilities uh, contribute or pay for their individual usage of it? Okay, well, uh, funding is from the National Science Foundation, okay? Yes, the National Science Foundation is divesting right now, uh, but the funding comes mostly from that. And from now, other, other institutes, we get NASA, uh, NASA grants. Uh, and, uh, and now for the first time with this new consortium, uh, they're looking for monies outside of the, uh, of the normal realm of, uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of monies uh, that in, in, from in the past. So again, the National Science Foundation used to do all the funding uh, for the observatory, where now uh, there's uh, uh, from, from other, other parts, even um, uh, let's say and from the Navy, uh, Naval Research Lab now, Air Force Research Labs. Uh, so we, uh, we'll do uh, right now, we'll do a pay to observe. Because again, NSF is, is, is divesting. And so the consortium is now with uh, uh, UCF, uh, University of Central Florida, uh, Yang Enterprises in Florida, and a local university. So the funding is now, it's is been, is, is been different from the past, but uh, luckily we could, we, we're, we're, we're still afloat and we're, we're still going and we'll, still, we'll, we'll be going strong. So we're on here tonight with uh, Angel Vasquez, who is head of telescope operations at the Arecibo Observatory and a Radio Club of America member. And uh, Angel, we thank you very much for, uh, for doing this this evening. And uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A or even in the chat. But the Q&A is probably easier for our moderators to navigate. And uh, Scott, another question for Angel. All right, um, so what's the latest on Arecibo's FRB research? Okay, and FRB. Okay, so that's that, that's that's, and we're going to get into we'll get into that. And right now, all the research has been halted at the observatory, as many of you know. Uh, we had an unfortunate incident uh, not too long ago. We had uh, an auxiliary cable, an auxiliary cable. Me está cortando la cabeza. He got an auxiliary cable that that came off, came out of its socket and fell onto the dish. This auxiliary, why, why I say auxiliary cable? Because the original uh, four cables that come from the towers, that were, those, were, those are not affected. But when we, when we lifted this dome and added all this weight, uh, we also had to add extra cables. And so we, to prevent uh, this now 600, 900 pound uh, platform, when, you, when, 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 this thing, when it turns, when this astronaut's arm turns, you'll get this uh, torque. So we added, some auxiliary cables to prevent this twisting. One of those cables was, was the one that snapped. That fell down onto the dish. This cable weighs 18,000 pounds, okay? It fell on a dish, broke a lot of the panels. Uh, what you see there, it is impressive, but uh, it's really, those panels are replaceable. Panels are replaceable, and so we have extra panels. Again, remember I mentioned there was a 39,000 uh, uh, panels by the three by six. So we've, we've got the panels. So what happens, all the research right now is halted because of, of the situation. So the FRB, not only the FRB, all, all uh, uh, science is, is held up at, uh, by this. But, uh, but back in the FRB, F, obviously FRB is one of the newest uh, uh, things in, in, in radio astronomy. And, and very interesting because these things are, I mean, these things are, are really amazing, right? Uh, there's about now three uh, repeating uh, 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 FRBs, fast radio bursts. The first repeating one was, was actually uh, uh, proven here in Arecibo. And so these are about 500 million to about 8 billion miles away. And when we're talking about distance, we're, we're talking about, okay, we're talking about 8 
billion light years away. I'm sorry, I said it's eight billion, from 500 million light years to eight billion light years, okay? Obviously, you know, a light year traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second for a year, you'll get to the first, uh, our, our, you know, you'll get, that's one light year. For example, our first star, our first star is four and a half light years away. So we travel at 300 kilometers a second for four years. We'll reach our next neighbor, our first neighbor, okay? And then uh, uh, 10 light years after that, we'll, we'll reach our second neighbor. So for something that is 8 billion light years away to receive this signal, the signal that's coming from a, a fast radio burst is 100 million times the energy produced by the sun in a day. It's coming from that one burst, okay? A hundred million times the energy the sun produces in a day from that millisecond burst that's coming from eight billion miles, eight billion light years away. So these things, obviously, we don't know what the, there's a lot of uh, different uh, uh, theories. They're not exactly I know where, 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 what it is. It could be a neutron star uh, next to a black hole uh, in, the, in the center of God. So there, there's a lot of theories that I'm, I'm, I am not a scientist or a theoretician. And so, but there are a lot of theories out there. And again, thanks for that question. But there is very, very interesting uh, 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 part of radio science. And uh, Unfortunately, right now, we can't do any radio science because of the situation, but that'll be rectified pretty soon. Thank you for the question. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm here. By, by the way, I am here uh, and back in me. All these, these are the Klystron tubes for our 2380 megahertz transmitter. Those are the tubes that, that, that power this, uh, uh, th this one uh, megawatt uh, transmitter. We have these, uh, these red ones here, and then we have that... Uh, Ichael, can you get that, the, the, the 430 megahertz uh, 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 Klystron? There's a Klystron for the 430 megahertz uh, transmitter. So that's the one uh, for the 430 megahertz. And there is two of them inside that. Uh, I don't know if, if, if uh, Israel can point, point to the, where uh, the hybrid transmitter is up there. There's a, in, that, in, in the box uh, yeah. right uh, yeah. there. There, so there's, there's two of them, there's two of them, uh, these uh, black klystrons in, in here. So these are uh, just, this, this is the transmitter room, by the way. This is the room uh, where we did the moon bounce back in 2010. This is the room. If you guys saw that QST article where uh, uh, Jim Brakel, Joe Taylor, NP4A, and a lot of other friends are participated in. This is, this is where actually uh, right back there is where we sat. If you see that article in the, in the QST. So we're in this, this is the 430 megahertz uh, uh, transmitter room. And by the way, that's, that's in there. Didn't mean to interrupt, but that, you probably was wondering where, where am I standing? So uh, back, back, back to you, the question. And we're okay. uh, more than glad. Right. To the question. Uh, thank you, Angel. And uh, Barney, another question. And maybe, okay. I, I see uh, sir, two questions oh, here. No, sir, okay. Interweave. Uh, the, generally, the question is, has the RF noise level increased over time that you've been there. And someone asked particularly, do you get RF interference from the flat panel monitors? And <laughs> is there any way you can mitigate the rising noise levels? Okay, that is such a good question. Because I am all, again, I, I am the spectrum manager also here in the Puerto Rico Coordination Zone uh, 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 manager. And uh, and RFI manager, I have a lot of hats, you know, but don't worry about it. I, I, I'll, I'll do windows and floors too, so. Um, so yes, yes, uh, this, this, um, uh, this RFI is a big issue. Yes, flat panels, that anything, anything, these L, anything with an LED screen will create RFI. Okay, anything with LED screen. Uh, we have such a big problem with RFI in, 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 in Arecibo because has it come over the years? Definitely has, in, because back when I started, there was no, there weren't Wi-Fi, uh, nothing was Wi-Fi. Now everything, you know, you have, you have a smart watch. Uh, you have uh, everything, is, everything to make your life simple is, is, is wireless. Here, we can't use any of that. We can't use any. So yes, uh, everything, we have so many uh, new cell systems, uh, towers down. We have Wi-Fi providers uh, uh, around. And this is why we have now this uh, Puerto Rico coordination zone, which I, I, I manage. So anyone that transmits within 100 miles of that dish 
including the Virgin Islands, has to go through my office. I have to do an analysis and I have to sign it. If they, you can't get an FCC license unless we go all this. And that is because all this is because RFI. So RFI mitigation is a big, big, big deal here. And so yes, everything that, that enters the observatory, everything that is electronic, okay, has to be, has to be tested. You can't come, you can't, you can't bring your laptop. You gotta turn off the Wi-Fi in your laptop. The first thing you gotta do, Turn off your Wi-Fi and don't use the clicker. And the uh, clicker is to open your car. Some some people we have to shut. Some people that some employees have these cars that they their cars won't start because the 430 megahertz transmitter is running. So we have to say, okay, guys, hey, uh, you know, uh, uh, Miss Santiago is going to leave. Can you lower the transmitter so you can leave? Whoop, and then so so yes, it's RFI is such a huge issue, such a huge the, the biggest thing right now. It's, and we have three people working on it uh, right now that do other things, and we're, we're in a hire just for someone just to do it. Because back when I started, it was easier to, to, to mitigate the RFI. It was kind of, but there are so many sources of RFI now. We, this is a 24-7, 24 24, 24 365 job. So we're getting a, we're getting a, a specified uh, a person to run this now. Great, great question. Yeah, super, Angel. Uh, Scott, what do you have up next? Uh, one of the earlier questions was, are you still using the RCA 6949 triodes in any of your transmitters? And uh, this is from uh, Michael, who says they used to send you their used ones from the Hilac accelerator. <laughs> okay, I'm not the I'm not the the transmitter engineer, and uh, so I don't I don't I don't recall uh, if I was if I was dealing with it, I probably could re recall it, but I I don't a person either. But let me tell you, if he used to use it, we still have that modulator tank that probably was in the modulator tank that's in an oil tank that that's right in back of me. That is still used. We're now we're converting it to solid state. So uh, as of uh, as of let's say last year. The answer was yes, we are still using it. <laughs> so you go, we you, still use, everything is tubed. Everything was still tubed. <laughs> and uh, over to you, Barney, for another question. Uh, there's a question here actually from Jim uh, Brakehall. Could you mention about the HF research that has been carried out over the years? Uh, was that Jim? Jim Brakehall, yes. Okay, yes, tell, him, tell him I don't want to answer that question. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> no, Jim, that'll cost you a beer. You know that, Jim. Okay, now, HF, obviously, Jim, we we're very, very glad to have Jim on, my brother Jim. And Jim designed uh, one of the HF antennas that, that, that we do use here. This is the antennas. These are cross dipoles at 5 and 8 megahertz located in the center of the dish. Okay, and um, again, uh, Jim, uh, since we lost the 430 megahertz uh, transmitter, uh, a lot of it has stopped because we use the 430. We, we, we heat the ionosphere and then we see the effects with the 430 megahertz radar. Since, it, since the 430 megahertz transmitter, uh, the modulator tank has been uh, damaged when we're getting a new one uh, installed, uh, not that much has been done. Again, uh, with the, the breakage of the, we were doing it, but with the breakage of the, uh, of the cable, when the cable came, came off the tower out of the socket, it fell and broke the subreflector. Okay, what is it, the subreflector? You know we have the main dish, but this was a subreflector that looked like a spider web that was hanging in between the, the platform and the main dish on the bottom. This was suspended, okay? And what would happen is uh, this, these um, six 100 uh, kilowatt transmitters, which would radiate from these cross dipoles, radiate in, into this subreflector off the main dish into the sky. Right now, it's gone because of the cable. So now, again, a lot of things have to be uh, replaced. That one, uh, that one cable, again, we're, right now we have three, uh, uh, we have, uh, three engineering firms that are dealing with this and everything. Uh, uh, every, we started uh, now reinforcing the other cable. So a lot of things going on. So, Jim, uh, your system is not being used now, but we're going to get it back up in the air, believe me. <laughs> and so we should comment that uh, Dr. Brakehall uh, from Penn State University is also an RCA director, and uh, we're very proud to have him on the board here at the Radio Club of America. And uh, this evening we have, uh, this is the RCA interview series with uh, Angel Vasquez here this evening. And uh, we wanna make sure that uh, all of our participants tonight uh, can ask questions, and also to go to the radioclubofamerica.org website 
for more information on past interview series that are all recorded and also on the future ones and also on our uh, new networking uh, campaign that we have coming up here very soon as well uh, for RCA members. And if you uh, would like to become a member of the Radio Club of America, that information is also on the Radio Club of America. That's all one word, dot .org website. Está muy bueno, está muy bueno. And so uh, another question, uh, Barney. Uh, let's see, where do we go? I see, uh, we see one here repeated in both the chat and the question and answer. And it's a multi-part question. I got to take one part at a time. Uh, do you ever use a thousand foot dish for transmitting? Is that how you get 70 dB of antenna gain? Uh, yes, because the collective area. So why do we have a thousand foot dish? If we would have had a, uh, let's say a, uh, a satellite dish, you can't, you get, you get more, more electrons on a thousand foot dish and, and photons and then, than you would on a, on a, on a, on a, a, a three foot dish. So yes, and that is part of the system. Uh, we don't use, uh, uh, we, we, we don't use uh, coax. We use, uh, you know, uh, waveguide. And so there's very, very little loss. We have, we have uh, a waveguide from this room all the way up to the platform. And it's at one point, it's one, uh, 1 1.2 dB of loss. Uh, so yes, the dish, obviously the dish, the, uh, uh, the gain, uh, it comes from the dish, from their systems and from the receivers. So it's all, it's all part of the telescope. Thank you, Reverend. All right. Very good, Angel. Scott, another question. One of the uh, questions that was brought up was um, uh, somebody had done some uh, Iridium Arecibo uh, coordination in the L-band uh, a number of years ago. Has the multitude of satellite launches since then impacted your ability to make measurements in any way? Yes, yes it has. And we have a coordination uh, with them. Uh, we do have a, a coordination with them, uh, GPS uh, and, uh, and GPS systems. We have coordinations with uh, a local uh, Puerto Rico National Guard. There. So there's a lot of a coordination that come. Obviously, a lot of satellites have come up. The Iridium has, uh, has, uh, has come up too. And uh, luckily, we do have some coordinations at, uh, at, at the frequencies that we use when we use it. And so, but it is, it is a problem. Yes, it has become a problem. And these things, again, um, these, they're, they're not going away. So we, we gotta learn how to deal with it. And, and Barney, another question for Angel. Uh, you may not be able to answer this question, Angel, but has the military <laughs> ever used this uh, facility for uh, uh, military uh, use? Um, I really can't answer that. Um, <laughs> I, I really rather not answer that, uh, but, but let me just say this. Let me can I can say this. The observatory is, was not put here for military. It's not here and doesn't serve a military purpose. For example, people say, "Oh, why don't you? Uh, that's such a big uh, radar and such a and can't you detect uh, you know uh, planes and stuff like that?" I said, "No, because if dude, the dish is fixed, and by the time we we rotate this, it, it, it's not designed for it." Okay, we, they're, you know, they're, they've been experimenting in the past. I'd rather not get into it, but it's not, no military use there, Barney, no military use. Uh, so, Angel, uh, when, uh, when I visited you a couple of times down there, there were even T-shirts that talked about the LGM, the Little Green Men. And so, uh, can you update us on Little Green Men? Okay. Yeah. Obviously, it's a, a big question. Obviously, from uh, when 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 you have a radial telescope. So yeah. So uh, the, the the little green man uh, is uh, is something that we've been uh, obviously the SETI program is a program that was funded by the government before. Nothing was found. So um, in the early '90s, the government stopped funding the SETI uh, program. But there have been SETI projects. There have been plenty of SETI projects. Project Phoenix, headed by uh, Dr. Uh, Jill Tarter and and Seth Sostak, another ham. Um, at that one had been that one kind of terminated. So it was it was privately funded. So people, you know, like uh, you know, Paul Allen. Uh, Paul Allen, Steven Spielberg, these guys with a lot of money, they had money to, 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 to spare, they would, they would start funding this. There's a big Paul Allen uh, a telescope array uh, that's being used for this. And we had here, uh, we had, well, I think I mentioned before, the SETI at Home Project, which is now quiescent. I think they're, they're going into another level. The SETI, at the, the, uh, um, this is a, a project that used one of our receivers. Every time we use this alpha receiver, 
the Arecibo low band uh, uh, frequency array, um, L band frequency array. Uh, when we used this, they used to piggyback and they used to use their million channel receiver to see if they would, if, 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 if ET would uh, phone home. Okay, obviously, uh, uh, it's very, very, it, it, was, it was something that everybody, everybody wants to be the first one. You know, when, when people say, um, you know, oh, it's hush hush, they don't want to say, they don't want to say anything. Listen, believe me, any country would want to be the first country to say, I discovered that. Okay, when they say, no, don't say anything. No, that's, that's, a, that's not true. Really think of it. If you guys think of it, you know, any country that says, uh, that says uh, you know, they say, no, they don't want to say, listen, if we found it, we're going to be the first ones to shout. So, but it, it, we didn't find it, but there are so many possibilities. You know, it's got, or, 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 or Barney, I forgot who asked the question, but, uh, our, and, and our friends that asked the question, there are so many possibilities out there. Yes, a lot of the scientists, uh, a lot of uh, uh, radios uh, and other uh, scientists believe in, 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 in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. When I mentioned before, okay, our first, our, our first uh, uh, star, as like, you know, as, as our sun is a star, okay? Our first star, the closest star, right? Alpha Centauri in the Alpha uh, in Centauri uh, is the closest one, okay? That... In, 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 and that is, that's in our, in, in our galaxy, okay? Our galaxy is composed of billions and billions of stars. Every, you know, billions and billions of stars may have billions and billions of, 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 of planets, okay? But now there are billions and billions of galaxies, okay? Which, can, which, which then, okay, is expanding. I, I, I gave this, I think, in one of... Uh, of Tim's talk there in in uh, in, in in Dayton in one in, uh, in 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 the uh, uh, antenna forum, and I remember I used this as an analogy. I said, hey, imagine you go to your fam your favorite beach and take a bucket, take a bucket and, and and dip the bucket, and then try to count all the all the grains of sand in that bucket. That's a lot of grains of sand. Okay, well, let's say that you look and you see. That whole beach, ladies and gentlemen, there are more stars in the universe than there are there are there there are stars, okay? And uh, there are more stars in you than there are grains of sand on Earth. There are more stars in the universe than there are grains. Of, I'm I'm not talking about your favorite beach or all the beach. Imagine I'm, I'm talking about Mojave Desert. You know, the, the, I'm talking about everything. Imagine trying to count. Imagine trying to count in a bucket how many grains of sand. So in the so uh, um, um, it's it's amazing. So yes, the possibilities are. Sorry for for this. Are astronomical. Yeah. So Angel, <laughs> Angel, if if all was well with the uh, dish and it was in uh, a state of operation, would there be experiments aimed at Mars right now because Mars is the closest to us now? It, it, I think it's for 15 years. Yes, okay, but that's a good question. And remember, the, we can only study, uh, study an object that is over the dish, okay? So I don't, I don't, I don't know what the RA and DEC the right ascension and declination, the position, the position of the of, of Mars is right now. But we will probably do. I can I can probably look that up really, really quick. Uh, I don't have it with me now. But um, if it was in in, in reach, we probably. Get, I think Mars is 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 too far uh, uh, south right now. I, I, we can only observe we can only observe from 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 the zenith 20, deg 20 degrees either north or south. If, if it's not, if it's not there, and like this, we can still, we can still uh, uh, observe a 40, you know, a 40% of the sky this way. So it's a, it's a good question, but I don't know right now where, where Mars is. If it was in, if it wasn't, and if we were, we would definitely be doing some, some, some work with that, uh, uh, Tim. Very good, Angel. Uh, another question, Scott. All right. Um, this kind of goes back to your question or your comments about, um, the radio free zone around Arecibo. Uh, you mentioned that uh, transmitters within 100 miles have to be coordinated. Uh, how does that impact, uh, you know, even amateur radio operations near there? You had mentioned the Virgin Islands are close enough. 
are there off frequency limits and that sort of thing um, is that so that quiet zone coordination is similar to what goes around say a green green bank is that right uh, that's a great question and um, so yes so I, I, I do manage the, the the Puerto Rico coordination zone the coordination zone and a quiet zone are two different things quiet zone means quiet quiet means nothing coordination means just that you have to coordinate first so if let's say if you are scott if you're a, a wabc and you want to raise your transmitter and you raise it up you made a modification raise the transmitter the fcc will go back and says uh, 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 did, did you did you have uh, did you have it cleared by the observatory and uh, if and you and you say no, then you have to go back. You got to send me then uh, all the parameters. We'll do an analysis, and then yes, and then we can do this. Uh, and that's that's how the that's and then that is again. So anybody transmitting within 100 miles of the center of this dish, from the from from uh, from the center of the dish, one, any this 100 mile radius has to be coordinated with, with Arecibo. Again, Arecibo is I mean, Puerto Rico is only you know uh, is a 35 by 100. Okay, uh, so. Um, this, 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 is, this, this covers, and, and Arecibo is almost in the center, so this covers everything. Actually, it covers up, uh, up to uh, uh, the Dominican Republic, where you don't have jurisdiction for that. Okay, so how does it affect uh, amateurs? Well, well, luckily, yours truly is a radio amateur also, so it, did, and, uh, so it does not. This is, it, it affects everyone within 100 miles, with the exception of... Uh, of our radio amateurs. Amateurs are not affected by this, but there is an exception even in that. The exception is if, if you have a, uh, a, a repeater. Repeaters within 10 miles, repeaters or beacons have to be coordinated. Amateur radio repeaters or beacons have to, have to be coordinated. As of this day, I have not uh, turned down any of them because the, uh, the frequencies do not, do not interfere and they are, shared, they are a shared band. Usually 70 centimeters is a, is a shared band, so I, we can't, it's shared. So I, I have never turned down, I, I, I myself have a repeater uh, within the 10 mile radius. And obviously for many, many years, um, uh, thanks to Jim Brakel, made uh, that call sign, WP3R famous, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with, with our radio, with, the, with our contest station right outside the observatory. I'm talking about right outside, mile, it's, it's right outside the observatory on a hill that, is, that it looks right at the, at, right at the platform. And uh, so uh, luckily for, for radio amateurs, it does not affect that, Scott. So no, uh, amateurs are, uh, are practically totally exempt from this uh, Puerto Rico coordination zone. Thank you, Angel. And Barney, another question. I uh, was thinking of the word coordination. There was a question asked about how often do you run coordinated experiments with other incoherent scatter radars around the world? Okay. Um, with other incoherent scatter radars around the world. Well, we don't do, uh, and there are, there are some experiments uh, that, that have uh, been done, okay? Because we want to see how, how the, eff the effects of, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the atmosphere, uh, the, the, the ionosphere goes. Actually, there, we used to do a lot of this uh, when the space shuttle went through the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the atmosphere, it creates a hole. You want to see how, 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 how quick does this, uh, 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 how, how quick did this hole uh, close up that's created by, by the, the flying through of, this, uh, of the space shuttle back, back in the day. Um, right, what we do mostly uh, collaborate with is uh, what we call uh, uh, interferometry, where we use uh, different telescopes from around the world. And uh, what, what happens is, uh, if we have a telescope, let's say in, uh, in Australia, and uh, in Arecibo in California. Well, it's, the effective aperture is the size of that. You get a dish, the effective of the aperture of, of I mean, the, uh, uh, the, the size of, of, of that. So, uh, and that means, that means you could actually pinpoint to hair the position of any, uh, of any object in the sky. But as for uh, uh, I, I, uh, incoherent scatter radars, well, ours is down right now, so we're not collaborating with anyone right now. Okay, and uh, Scott, another question. So what, um, one of the questions that came up was, what is the upper and lower frequency range of the dish? Well, that's a great question too. So again, that, that goes back to our, our uh, multi-faceted uh, uh, <laughs> analogy that I did here. So we go from about uh, 47 megahertz to 10 gigahertz. Okay, and for example, uh, the, uh, the, the fast, 
which is the China's telescope, uh, operates at uh, 1420 L band. That's it. Okay. One, fre one frequency, no transmitter. So yes, we have multifaceted and uh, multi-frequencies and, mul and multi-transmitters. Very good. Uh, Barney, another question for Angel. Uh, would a super flare from the sun wipe out the whole system? If we were, yes, well, that's a good, that's a great question because uh, if, when, if we're observing, we can't observe around, around the sun because it does affect, it does affect the observations. It will affect the observations. And if our, uh, a, a super, a super flare will not, let's say, a re, uh, damage the receivers per, per se, but if we, if we were kind of, if we were like uh, uh, going through it, Let's say, let's say we were going through uh, the the uh, uh, the beam of the sun. There's a lot of damage that probably could could, could be done with. A, if you say a super flare, it has been done before uh, that the temperature goes up skyrocket. But again, these the, it, it, it's very it, you know uh, the the time constant is a maybe a, a little bit longer. And so and and again, these things these things don't last a long time in the beam. So Angel, um, uh, we know that you, you're working on repairs that. Uh, happen from the hurricane. When do you expect the dish will be back 100% and everything will be running just as it should be? Okay, uh, great. Great question. I know everyone wants to, wants to know about that. And uh, so today was fantastic. We started first the first phase of this today. First phase is reinforcing the existing cables. Okay, so now we, we've, we've put, we put uh, uh, tension, tension monitors on all the cables. Uh, wh what happened in, in the cable up there, again, the cable actually bloop, popped out of the socket. Okay, so now we have, we have some monitors that, that, uh, that, that monitor this, any, any movement outside. We, we monitor that, we monitor the stress on the cable. So we started with this first. Okay, we got to make sure everything is okay because we don't want to start fixing it, and something else is going to uh, break. So this is going to this is this is going here. We've got already uh, all the final quotes to get the to get the cable out. Uh, that's going to be done uh, in, uh, in 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 a few uh, in a few weeks. And uh, so the final outcome to not to, to extend this uh, too much. The final we're we're looking we're looking anywhere uh, from about eight months to 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 a year to get it back. But remember, it's a lot, and and uh, and there's a lot of work going on. We don't. There's a lot of work going on, and once it starts on, once it starts rolling, we're gonna go. We're, we're gonna keep. We're gonna go. We're, we're gonna go with it. And that means that means that we have to uh, we have to repair the dish. We have to repair panels on the dome that were were affected. We had to we have to realign the dish. Okay, we have to realign the platform. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, 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 you know, realignment that has to be done. And so um, uh, with all this, and then we have to get the transmitters, we have to get the transmitters uh, uh, going. And so all these, we have, we have different crews, okay? We have a platform crew, we have a transmitter crew, we have electronics crew, we have operations crew. So these crews are gonna be working around the clock. We're gonna, we wanna get this done. So yeah, so our outlook is gonna be about, uh, uh, about, a, about a year to get everything back. Okay, that, that's but, but, very but, good, but, Angel. But, 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 but again, that, that, that's, like, that's the answer. They get everything back. That doesn't mean we can't start to do other observations. We're talking about, you know, every, everything back right. turnkey. Yeah. Right. Now, Angel, you, you've hosted uh, several uh, featured films and movie stars down there that have used Arecibo as <laughs> part of the films. Uh, t tell our viewers a little bit about... Uh, you know, uh, the, the folks, uh, you know, James Bond, all this stuff that happened. You know, uh, the, we've, been, we've been lucky. Uh, we've been in the right place at the right time, I guess. And um, uh, during, the, uh, during the upgrade, the, the, the Gregorian upgrade, uh, when we were raising the Gregorian, uh, we, we had, a, we, we had a, a no operation time. So uh, we, we, you know, Hollywood kind of uh, found out about this. And so they came down. So this was back in the, in the mid-90s. And this is when uh, we did the James Bond, uh, first the James Bond, Phil Goldeneye. And, um, and <laughs> hey, Tim, some, someone has to take care of them. So I, I said, ah, don't worry about it, I'll volunteer. So, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so we got, we obviously, we, we got to, uh, uh, we got to meet uh, uh, Pierce Brosnan. He actually, it's a funny story. Pierce was right outside the control room. I, I'm in the control room. I, we, I, we, I know he's here. 
I know he's coming, but you know, we know he's coming. So um, he's here and he, he came up, you know, he, he was using that, that green uh, army uh, uh, outfit that, uh, in, in a lot of the scenes. So he was outside and back then in the mid nineties, the, uh, the, uh, the, the tourists were outside the control. They go outside the control room. So you can see, so he, was, he, he just came walking up the hill. I remember he came walking up the hill and he, 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 before he coming into the control, he went outside, he wanted to see the telescope. So he was out there and he was out with the, with, with the crowd. And you can see some people like saying, well, this guy's kind of dressed kind of funny. And his, but you see some people like kind of murmuring. So I, I, I went out there. I said, Pierce, hey, come inside. How are you? Welcome to the observatory. Come inside. I'll give you the tour inside. So I, I, I had a great time giving him the tour, but it was funny. As soon as I bring him in, you can see through the, through the glass from the outside. And you can see the people. I said, you see, that's what I told you. That was the guy. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, Pierce was, was a, a sweetheart. Uh, he took the time. He was here for two weeks. He took the time to actually meet everyone everyone on, on site, every single person, and gave everybody an autograph, he, everybody. We have 150 employees. These people are so busy and then doing, he says, no, I want to meet everyone. And he got, the, and he, he did that. So Pierce was a sweetheart. So I got to meet Pierce Brosnan and, uh, and see, and actually, and be in all those, uh, all the, all those uh, <laughs> shots here at the, at the observatory, all this, you know, that was funny too. Uh, but we had all those, all those uh, fight scenes, you know, and, uh, you know, they're, they're using guns, stuff like that. And local people thought we were under siege. Whereas, you know, we were under attack because they heard all this gunshot and explosions. And, <laughs> and so it was just a, a filming of the movie. And so that was one. Yeah. Angel, how about Jody Foster? Oh, that's it. So Jody, that was another one. So Jody, it's, it's, it's a little closer to home, right? Because Jody starts uh, the film. This was Contact, the movie, okay, as, which, which uh, was filmed here in, in, in Puerto Rico. And um, uh, it starts off with, with Jody Foster, right, on a ham radio set and said, you know, she can't really make that contact. And, uh, and she said, you know, I need a bigger telescope. And then, boom, then here comes the Odyssey Observatory that you see her looking at. So, and that one, that was cool because that was all, all the shots here. I actually was, again, eh, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. So, <laughs> so I was actually in all those scenes. And would say, I, was, I was not in the scenes. I was behind the scenes and all the... All, all the shots. Somebody had to be there. They, I mean, actually, you know, so you, we can't have people running around. So we had to, we had to be in here. And it was one funny, one, one scene, actually, there's a couple of scenes that they did. But there was, I remember one scene where she's talking to uh, uh, Matthew McConaughey. And uh, they're sitting down and she's looking at, at Venus. And then she's pointing uh, to, uh, to, to Cassiopeia. And then so what funny, she, she points uh, like this way. And then goes this way, and she says, Cassiopeia. And I told the director, hey, you guys are going to come, but that's not the way you say it, man. And, and, and you see, and it's, Venus doesn't rise from that side. Venus always comes from this side. So if you want to make it right, then people know this place. Make it right. So actually, I had a little bit of say in that. So, so we, we, we changed it from uh, Cassio, uh, Cassiopeia to Cassiopeia. So, and I, again, that, that, and, and she was also great. If you look at my QRZ page there, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, I also was, had the, uh, uh, the honor of, uh, of giving Jodie Foster the tour. Actually, took her to the platform and showed her the, she was also very, very, very gracious. And so we met Bob Zemeckis, everyone else in there. So that was great. So again, being an observatory, not only uh, being a ham, working at the observatory, isn't it great? They get to meet so many uh, uh, amazing people. Like it wasn't for this, I wouldn't have met uh, people like Scott and Barney and then Tim, or Mr. Ham Radio, as I call him, Mr. Ham Radio. Tim Duffy is Mr. Ham Radio. And all my friends out there, you know, Joe, Jim, and all, this has given me the opera radio, uh, radio, the ham radio has given me the opportunity to meet all. If I was not in here, the observatory, uh, you know, I would have not met any of this. I would not have done any of this. So the, the radio observatory, ham radio has been very good to Angel Vasquez. Really, really good. So thank you, Angel. Uh, so let's do uh, final questions here. Uh, we really appreciate your time, Angel, and we know it's uh, valuable uh, telescope time uh, there at the, uh, at the observatory, that there's a lot going on. So uh, let's go to Scott for his final question here this evening. There are quite a few questions. So, um, um, so what are the Internet links that come back uh, out of Arecibo to connect the rest of the world um, as a sec two-part question? And has uh, Arecibo ever suffered, suffered lightning damage? 
Okay, yes, well, that's, those are two real good questions. Okay, the, the, the link that coming out that, that right now, we, we, have, we have a brand new AT&T link, that's one, it's a gigabit. And so that's the one that we use in it now. And um, uh, Lightning, yes, well, uh, we're very high up. Okay, we're not as high, we're not the highest point in, in, uh, in Puerto Rico, but we are, uh, the towers are up uh, about uh, 1,300 feet. And uh, you're gonna, we, we get hit by lightning all the time. We have lightning arresters and, and, and the like. So damage, uh, luckily we haven't had damage, but you know, uh, a grounding is a big thing. When I first time I made the grounding, it was not as good. I remember being in the control room, we getting struck by lightning and seeing uh, you know, fireballs go through the cable trays in, 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 into the, uh, uh, the floor. So uh, that's been, that, that luckily has not been uh, there. And I'm glad the head of electronics was with me when he saw it, because he wouldn't have believed me. But, <laughs> but uh, so lightning, no, we have we, we've been, been real lucky. No lightning damage. No, no damage. That minor things. Always something always happens, but no, no nothing to uh, nothing to write home mom about. So uh, Scott, get another question together. Let's go to Barney. And uh, Barney, what have you you got there? Okay, one of the questions here was, and you mentioned um, Angel, there are 150 employees. Is that a a normal uh, number of people there? And have you had to add? or been able to add more people to help with this uh, recent repair uh, projects? Okay, so uh, 150 was when we were uh, at our most robust uh, time, okay? And so um, normally about 120, uh, Barney, uh, about 120. Uh, this includes about uh, uh, 25 uh, uh, on the scientific staff and then uh, about the same electronic staff. The biggest, uh, uh, the biggest uh, staff uh, we have seven here in, at, 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 uh, in, uh, in telescope operations and about seven in, 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 in IT and stuff like this. The biggest, the biggest uh, uh, staff, uh, members of the staff are in maintenance. Remember, this is a huge facility. And so uh, a lot of, uh, mostly um, about 80, uh, you know, more than 50% is, is maintenance staff. So right now it's, uh, it's 100, about 120. And was that, was there another part to that question? And I was, the other part that I was thinking myself was, uh, in this period that you're doing these repairs over the next <clears throat> six to eight months, are, is that all being done by your uh, regular employees? Okay, so that's another good question. I think I mentioned before, we have three uh, engineering firms that are uh, working with this, uh, getting how, uh, you know, logistics of how this is getting done. They're probably gonna have, they're probably gonna have some, some people coming down, but most of the work, most, almost all the work uh, can be done by, by the, the, the staff here, by the crew here. We have, we have people that, that, uh, that work on that platform, uh, that, that know that platform like the back of their hands, nobody like them. Uh, very good, uh, Angel. Uh, Scott, uh, let's, let's, let's see if you can wrap it up with uh, the questions here. Okay. Is the uh, S-band transmitter the highest frequency used? And if so, what's the smallest feature the ray car radar can resolve given the resolution is a, f some, a function of uh, wavelength? Okay, that is the highest frequency <laughs> radar that we do. The highest frequency uh, radar that we do is the 2380 uh, uh, megahertz radar. And um, uh, right now, we're, they, we've been, enough, I, I, have, I have here with me, uh, I wanna thank also, <laughs> let me, I, they're probably gonna give me up this. Uh, I, I wanna thank of, Officer Zapata here and, and, and KP4AX, uh, Mr. Israel, who is uh, the operator uh, for the S-band transmitter. We did, uh, and, and I would like to ask, uh, um, they were, what, what is now the, the we, we did an upgrade, uh, the latest upgrade, uh, the resolution. What is the biggest resolution you get on, on now on, on, on an asteroid? Oh, oh, you got me there. It, it was about, it was less than a kilometer. Less than a kilometer, obviously. Yeah, less than a kilometer. Yeah, it was, it was less. It's, it's much less. I mean, uh, I, I don't remember that the, the, uh, uh, the we, we had the reason why um, we, we just did an, an upgrade not too long ago, uh, and this, the, the resolution was increased immensely. And so we, we can get, we can, we can, we can see a, we can see a one kilometer, we can see a one kilometer uh, asteroid. And so it can go down to, we can go down to a, a few, a, a few, uh, a few meters. Almost a basketball. Yeah, no, no, yeah, almost like a, we can, we can detect it. Definitely we can detect it. So, so right now I don't know the, the actual, uh, the actual number. So I don't want to, I, I don't, I don't want to get it over my head because I know we just did an upgrade. Okay. Very good, Angel. Barney, a final question from you tonight. Oh, let's see what you're, oh, I guess take a, a simple one. 
uh, what's the two part actually, what's the operating budget of your facility and uh, relative to that, the cost of the repairs of that cable that pull apart? Okay, the operating, the, the budget, okay, what, it, it went down. It used to be about 12 million and it go, it's gone down. Uh, but right now, the, uh, it's about $8 million, uh, right now. Uh, and uh, to fix, we, uh, because of Hurricane Maria, we've got some monies from Congress and stuff. Um, and we, we had a few million to, to fix that. This uh, estimated uh, cost, uh, we're going through that process right now because there are so many things. Uh, so the final estimates are, are, are not done there, Barney. Uh, but what we're thinking, uh, you know, uh, uh, over, over, over 15 million. Very good. Angel, I, I want to thank you and uh, uh, Israel and the rest of the staff there at uh, Arecibo for letting us uh, come in this evening with the Radio Club of America interview series. This has been a phenomenal night. Thank and you. Thank uh, you very much. I, I know there's a lot of smiles all around the world. Uh, and uh, some of the folks that are on here uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Frizzell is on, um, Dr. Brakehall, Dr. Taylor, and, uh, and many other members of the RCA and some guests uh, as well. And uh, right. certainly, uh, if you're not a current member of the Radio Club of America, please consider joining. Uh, there's a lot of exciting things going on. There's a lot of great history with the RCA, and there's a great future that we're working on with the Radio Club of America. So, Go to the website, radioclubofamerica.org, and uh, consider joining. And make sure that you're on for our uh, RCA members only networking event coming up, and also our next interview series. And we've got uh, great interviews uh, planned here. And uh, we want to thank you so much, Angel, for, for all that you do for the uh, observatory <laughs> and for radio and science. And thank you for being here tonight. Thank you very much, Tim. I want to thank, oh, first, let me thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank you, the RCA, Scott, Barney, and a big shout out to, to my friends out there. My good friends at Hamside, Nathaniel, Phil Erickson, all my friends at Hamside, my friends at the BGFN, the Big Gun Friendship Net, where we get on 40 meters, uh, Jim, and all, all our friends. I don't know if we have a few, huge from, from Bulgaria, Qatar, and uh, you know, Romania, we have uh, Italy, all of them. I want to shout out to them, my ham radio friends around the world, and obviously all our visitors and guests and my friends that I've made uh, throughout my years because of uh, this fantastic hobby with, that is amateur radio. Get up and if you haven't been a member of RCA, I recommend it. It's a great group of guys. And you, who knows, you'll be in there too. Meet the Tim and all these fabulous guys that are in here. I'm just honored and, uh, and, and dumbfounded by, that I'm actually standing here talking to you guys. I, I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you very much. And thanks to our moderators, uh, Scott Jones and Barney Scholl. And also thanks to our president, Carol Hollingsworth, and our uh, senior vice president, John Fasella, our executive vice president, John Fasella, and our vice president, uh, Chip Cohen. Thank you for your leadership. And I know Margaret Lyons, our secretary, was on here tonight, and many other of the directors and officers of the Radio Club of America. So on behalf of the RCA, uh, I wish you all a good night. And this was recorded, so it will be available for playback on YouTube right off of the RCA website. So look for that. And thank you to our executive secretary, Amy Beckham, for all she did to make this happen here tonight. So I wish you all a good night, good evening. And Angel, it's off to 40 meters. Yes, sir. Be there in about 20 minutes. It'll take me that to get home. Take okay. care, guys. Have a good night. Thank you again. Good night, everybody.